Hello everyone, this is the third and final video in my series about Diablo Immortal. If you haven't seen the first video, that was me explaining why the fans reacted the way they did, and the second video was addressing the early April Fool's joke, because in reality it was previously a Blizzard April Fool's joke. You can check out both of those videos, I'll have links below. As for this video, well, we're going to be discussing the marketing difference between Blizzard and Bethesda. You see, many people have suggested, perhaps, that... Blizzard had a Diablo 4 announcement, and they pulled it at the last minute. If this is true, then whoever's responsible for pulling it at the last minute needs to apologize to all the community managers who have to deal with the fallout from his actions. They have to apologize to the guys up on stage presenting Diablo Immortal. In short, that person, assuming this is true, is responsible for a lot of bad. So what separates Bethesda and Blizzard in terms of the mobile games they announced? Well, we know Diablo Immortal is being published by Blizzard. It's being developed by NetEase, a mobile developer in China. And on the other side, we have Elder Scrolls Blades, a mobile game being published by Bethesda Softworks, but not being made by Bethesda Game Studios. At least not the main team that makes the Elder Scrolls games. This is an entirely separate entity that exists to make the mobile game. Kind of like the way Fallout Shelter wasn't actually made by Bethesda either. Neither was Elder Scrolls Legends. So what separates these two major events? What makes Bethesda's okay and Blizzard's not okay? That's where it ties into that hilarity where people are saying, don't you get it? They were going to announce Diablo 4 and didn't. It's okay. They announced Elder Scrolls 6 right after announcing Elder Scrolls Blade. So instead of everyone going, what? That's it? They instead, in their heads frame Elder Scrolls Blades as if it's just a side project. Nothing, nothing serious to think about. Don't worry about it. Flip on over to Diablo Immortal, and they announce Diablo Immortal as if it is the end-all be-all. I mean, they, they whispered that, yeah, we got other Diablo projects, but we aren't ready to announce them yet. And that's great and all, but that means what? They're going to have a Diablo board game? A, another character expansion to Diablo 3? Because we all came back for the Necromancer one. Yeah, right. My point more than anything is that people had no indication that this wasn't the main event. That this, this was supposed to be the next and complete Diablo experience and they felt earnestly disappointed. If you want to know why they felt disappointed, again, I, I discussed that in my first video. And I use a car metaphor in that video because car companies have done this three times in history that I'm aware of. So it was pretty easy doing that. My point is Bethesda sandwiched Fallout 76, Elder Scrolls Blades. My point is everyone knew Fallout 76 was coming. There's new content relevant to the general Bethesda sphere, right? Then they announce this Elder Scrolls Blades. People look at that and go, well, it's not what I want. And before they have a chance to complain, you see, whereas Blizzard had uh, question and answer sessions where almost every one of their questions couldn't be answered properly because they weren't ready to talk about monetization. They weren't ready to talk about the details of the game and how it compares to NetEase's stuff. They, they were not ready to answer any of those questions. So compare that again to Bethesda, where Bethesda had no Q&A session for this. Instead, Bethesda just steamrolled over any potential complaints about the mobile game with announcements for Starfield and Elder Scrolls VI. Now, the interesting thing about those announcements is that they had no substance to them at all. They were pathetic six-second splash screens, little title screens, that contain no value whatsoever. But in the terms of public perception, 
Elder Scrolls 6 and Starfield are the main event. And they're willing to overlook this side project, which is the mobile game, in order to get to that. It's simple PR. And they managed to nail it. Now, that's not to say that questions weren't answered. Remember, Todd Howard isn't a game developer. He's an administrator who tells the different developers what to do. He's a director. So as a director, he is a big picture sort of person. He has a broader perspective on the project as a whole and can in theory make at least a few snap decisions about what will and won't be in the game. So when he talks about it, he talks about it with authority. Unlike the people who were speaking on behalf of Blizzard, who were presenting something that a different company was working on. And they, they had practically no authority on this. All they could do is make a joke. You guys don't have phones. How patronizing is that? Well, either way, even if Bethesda didn't answer any questions initially, people took to social media and were like, these card backs, they look a lot like loot boxes. Enter Pete Hines. He is public relations for Bethesda Softworks. His job, through and through, is to protect the image of the company, to foster and grow the image of the company. That's what he does. He's not a game developer. He exists there for damage control, as well as just growing the Bethesda brand, fostering, protecting the Bethesda brand. So, when people asked, well, those card packs look a lot like loot boxes, Pete Hines was there, and the other people in PR were there. And they told people that, no, no, these card packs are only earned through gameplay. When people asked about the microtransactions, they said, no, no, they'll be cosmetic only. You see, they had answers about the monetization, and those answers put people at ease. The funny part is people should be asking these questions about Elder Scrolls Blades, which is a mobile game, not Fallout 76. But Fallout 76 was presented as the ever-present here problem, the immediate problem. Uh, after all, out of sight, out of mind, people have since forgotten about Elder Scrolls Blades other than, you know, the, the impulse to pre-register for it. And that's intentional. People know it's coming out. They've pre-registered for it. But the hype the enthusiasm, the excitement is kept on a low burn because the people who want a mainline Elder Scrolls game, they're looking to the future for Elder Scrolls 6. The people who want something immediate now, 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 they're looking at Fallout 76. In short, Bethesda sandwiched their controversial pick between other things which would take precedence and mitigate any kind of outrage. This was PR done right. Now the funny part is that we can actually glean quite a bit from Blizzard's inability and unwillingness to say too much about the game. They claim it's been built from the ground up and they've been working together all this time, but if we've looked at, say, Elder Scrolls Online and that little theme park MMO there, we know that working closely with Bethesda didn't actually produce things that were lore-friendly. No, indeed, they produced things that were horribly inaccurate and broken. And then the lead writer turned lore master, Lawrence Schick, had to come through and write up supplementary materials to explain away all the inconsistencies. Like, that thing was so filled with plot holes it looked like Swiss cheese, and it's mostly band-aids at this point, you know, covering up the holes. I expect nothing less with Diablo Immortal, with NetEase working closely with Blizzard. Do you know another game that Netties worked closely with Blizzard on? Diablo 3. Should I say the Chinese version of Diablo 3? See, Diablo 3 was initially submitted for uh, approval and rejected in the Chinese market. So 
NetEase came in, they became the publisher for Diablo 3 in China, and they produced their own Chinese exclusive version of Diablo 3. Uh, don't Google uh, Diablo 3 China Shop. Don't, don't do it. Their partnership isn't anything new. But at the very least, when they were making their Chinese version of Diablo 3, it was Diablo 3. This looks a hell of a lot like a certain other game that you, you can download the APK file for, by the way, and load it onto your Android device, no problem. Endless of God. So all these websites that bang their hands down on the table, shouting, Blizzard says this is not a copy. Blizzard says this is not a reskin. Blizzard says this. We've tried it, it's not a copy. Are you absolutely certain? Because we look at screenshots and they're, they're pretty similar, okay? Not just the user interface, but like the, the character skills, okay? This looks like a reskin. It plays like a reskin. It smells like a reskin. I'm sure we can convey smells over the internet like my smell of pretentiousness. It's, it's gotta be a reskin. It, it might not be. I might be wrong, but I'm not willing to trust the word of an online article over my faculties of sight and sound and the ability to compare two sets of footage in real time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just not buying what they're selling. Now, here's the thing though. NetEase is producing a game for the Asian market. Not for the United States, not for the rest of North America, and not for Europe. So all the classic Diablo fans who are outraged, well, why would they be outraged? This wasn't designed for them, but you marketed it at them. Why, why did you market something at them when it wasn't made for them? I'm told, this, this may not be true, but I'm told Diablo 3 in China is raking in enough money to pay for the game in the rest of the world. And if that is true, then it makes sense that they are going to aim at the Asian market. Hey, you love that Diablo 3, right? Well, guess what we have for you? We have Diablo for your cell phone. We know how huge cell phone games here are. The market is exploding in China. It's exploding in Korea. It's exploding in Japan. And we realize you may not have space in your one room Tokyo apartment you share with two other people. You don't have a PC because there's no space. You don't have a console because there's no space. You barely have room for a television which the other two people are watching. So what do you play on? You play on your little phone because everything's so freaking cramped. That's how the mobile market exploded. Very often people can't afford their own houses, their own apartments. So they share and in sharing they do not have the space to be a gamer per se, despite them enjoying games. This fundamental difference between the Asian markets and the European and North American markets means that Diablo Immortal is probably going to explode over there and bring them great success. But they couldn't be content to just market it over there and release it over there. No, 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 no. We have to make as much money as possible. And that's what it looks like this is going to be. This is going to be a game built for the Asian market. But you guys can have it too, I guess. But from the perspective of the fans, marketing disaster. If you had a Diablo 4 to announce, you should have announced it. Even just a still picture of Diablo 4 in pre-production, people would have bought it. They would have pre-ordered that Diablo in pre-production. By the way, pre-production can last 10 plus years. Pre-production just means we're throwing design documents around, but we're totally gonna make it eventually, wink wink. So how did Bethesda know to do what they did? And Blizzard didn't know to do what they did. You see, Blizzard has languished in complete praise by people who spend $200 to attend their conventions. Rarely, if ever, did they have a complete audience they needed to flip the opinion of. Has managed to lazily get by with comments like, you think you want that, but you don't. 
that was the beginning of the real tone deaf, we know better than you attitude was the, you think you want that, but you don't. And the worst criticism they've been facing was a red shirt guy complaining about lore related to Falstead Wildhammer in a book, which they themselves fostered into a meme by not only fixing it, but then adding the red shirt guy into the game as a fact checker, kind of poking fun at the fact that they didn't get it right, but this red shirt guy did, you know? See, Blizzard hasn't faced true adversity, not in a very long time, so they've grown weak. They didn't anticipate a negative response in their new Diablo Immortal announcement, and they had no plan for dealing with it. Bethesda, on the other hand, has always presented at E3. Now, E3 is not a Bethesda event. People coming to E3 are going to be watching EA, Ubisoft, Microsoft, Sony, among countless other companies vying for their attention, vying for their headspace. In other words, you know, Bethesda, we don't really care about that, but look at that Sony! Look at, look at what Sony's showing! So they had to scrape and claw for their attention. They had to announce something every year or they were wasting time and money just being there. Bethesda Softworks is not Bethesda Game Studios. Bethesda Softworks can call upon id Software, Arcane, and countless other smaller studios all affiliated with the ZeniMax Media Group that owns them. So when they get on stage, it's their job to wow people with the material that they have collected from any of the sub-studios. Marketing is very important to them. Now they barely scraped by two E3s ago when fans cheered but called it extremely disappointing by the standards of Bethesda. And Bethesda learned from it. Bethesda had Todd Howard get up on stage this year. He diffused the Bethesda's re-releasing Skyrim on everything by making a joke of the Skyrim Very Special Edition. He threw back his own, you know, it just works with sometimes it doesn't just work. And he made jokes. Jokes diffused the building tension and turning the issue into a meme. And memes can be used to your advantage. They're not taken seriously. There are a lot of people who want to tell me that Diablo Immortal is going to be a terrible video game. I don't know if it's going to be a terrible video game or not. I haven't had a chance to try it yet. I've had a chance to try one of the clones of it, and that was okay. It wasn't something I'd play for very long, but it was all right. Entertaining mildly. So, if Diablo Immortal is better than those clones, well, well, I guess I'll give it a try. It's safe to say that Diablo Immortal is not the Diablo everyone wanted. And when I say everyone, I mean the vast majority. Obviously, if you're in the 0.1 percentile of people who really wanted it, good on you. You're, you're a free-thinking individual. But the vast majority did not want this. I don't want this either, but I'll give it a shot. It's going to be free to play, most likely. Let me just say one more thing, though, before I sign off. And that is, when the developers tell you they are developing a game first and the monetization second, that means knowing that a free-to-play game is designed around the microtransactions in order to survive, it means either, number one, they are incompetent developers who cannot design their games around the microtransactions instead are going to ham-fist them into the game later. This will result in a terrible video game with terrible microtransactions that nobody wants. Or number two, it means that possibly it's not going to be free to play. You're going to buy the game on mobile. I don't think that's going to happen. That's very unlikely. And there's a super secret third option. They were lying to your faces. And they knew all along what it was going to be. They handcrafted the microtransactions. If you want to hear me talk about them handcrafting microtransactions, check out my first of these three videos. But I think we pretty much wrapped this up. I'm looking forward to seeing how Diablo Immortal and Elder Scrolls Blades turnout. I really am. But Blizzard, seriously, you need to get back in touch with gamers, okay? The, 
the consumers of your products. Right now, you are horribly out of touch. This is bad. And this will affect your ability to put out not only materials, but marketing that consumers want. It will eventually affect your bottom line if you aren't careful. To the rest of you, don't pre-order anything and try not to prejudge things as much. This isn't what we want, obviously, but uh, might be good. And if it isn't, we'll tear it to shreds when it comes out. <laughs> If you really want a moral to take away from this, adversity builds character. Maybe not a good character, but some sort of character.